This morning we're going to talk about how to do a try catch in T-SQL. And if you saw my previous video or one of my previous videos with PowerShell, you'll notice that I used a try catch in PowerShell. This time we're going to be using a try catch uh, with T-SQL. And the way we're going to, first of all, demonstrate it is very simple with just a obvious error. Well, first of all, let's just do this. We're going to select 1 divided by 0. And you'll notice that we get an error message which says divided by 0 error encountered. So normally that would print out this red ugly error. So let's go ahead and use a try catch and see what we get. second here. And you'll notice we get no result, but it doesn't throw a red error at us. Instead, we see zero rows affected, uh, and we also see uh, error invalid query. If you'll give me one second, one thing I want to do really fast, just to also show you this. If we do a set no count on, that removes the zero rows affected or the one row effective. So, uh, that way we don't have that anymore. Okay, so you'll notice <clears throat> um, that a try catch can prevent the ugly um, red message, which again doesn't seem like a big deal, but suppose you have uh, several queries and you're doing a loop and you're passing information through the loop um, and you have one query and the next query and the next query, the idea is it won't break the process. So the syntax is just begin try, uh, then you select one divided by zero, you have end try, you have begin catch, and then you do whatever you want to do when it catches the error, and then you have your end catch. Uh, so again, it's, it's very similar to um, an if statement. If you recall, an if statement in T-SQL is, you know, if something, and then you have begin and end, and so on and so forth, and then else. Okay, so let's kind of see this in an example of action. Let's see this in action. So let's look at one of the tables here I have is called the fail table. Um, this is just for the purpose of uh, failing something. So you'll notice with fail table, we have one column ID. Okay, and then let's look at a stored procedure here. And we have a stored procedure here called check fail table. And you'll notice what it is, is it selects ID and name from fail table. But if we look at it, we see that there is no name field, there's only an ID field. So, <clears throat> in other words, our stored procedure does not match a table. And by the way, in production, in a lot of production environments, you will find this happens quite frequently. So, what we are going to do is we are going to... It's a good question if this actually exists in a... Yeah, it does in a SQL Server Express. Okay, we are going to check if the object is valid. So what this stored procedure does right here is it checks if the stored procedure, if all the data in the stored procedure work. This is a really uh, good stored procedure to use when you upgrade environments. Uh, for instance, when I went from 2005 to 2012, we would check stored procedures to see if they were valid. And we, of course, came across a lot of them that were invalid. Some of it is related to the fact that tables have changed. But this is one of those great stored procedures to use from time to time. I would say probably once a month to make sure that your table definition matches your stored procedures and what they're assuming. So, if we execute it, what happens? It tells us invalid common, uh, column name, name. Because as we saw, the stored procedure doesn't have, or it includes name, but the table doesn't have name, okay? So, and um, so I'm, I'm using this as a really quick example. Let's suppose we had a database with hundreds of stored procedures, views, and uh, just other objects in general, like uh, scalar functions. And we wanted to do a loop where we would pass in each of those to check if the module existed, okay? Well, again, we could do a uh, begin try, right? One second. 
one second. Um, now, in in the actual loop itself, this right here would be a variable that would be changing. And so I would pass that variable, for instance, like here, plus, uh, plus, and then space failed, as a case in point. But we're not doing that because that would take a while um, to build, but you can do that on your own. You can loop through each of your stored procedures and use this. And then you would have this execute here where it would try, and if it worked, it would go through, and then you would catch the error. And uh, so give me a second. The reason why, um, yeah, the reason why this is not going to work here is because it would need to be a part of that loop. And uh, I'm going to check really fast, but if there's, uh, there may be code that I have on GitHub that does something similar to this and catches the errors. But this is a, a good example of where you would use a try catch if you had a loop. So this would kind of be how it would be set up, and then you'd have dynamic SQL here, and it would be executing whatever it gets passed in, and it would catch any error. So the great thing about uh, try catches is, and again, it's, it's any type of sequencing item where it needs to continue. If you get an error, especially if you're like using C Sharp, it's, this happens a lot with C Sharp and it's very annoying, but um, you'll get an error and it'll break all of your code. And so as a case in point, the other day I was importing some data from Bitcoin and every now and then the site goes down or every now and then the database doesn't connect, it just happens. And maybe another process is going on. Well, if you don't have a begin try, what happens? You have this uh, web error that says unhandled exception, yada, yada, yada. You know, it breaks, the program stops. And then uh, Windows, of course, throws up that uh, window that says, hey, do you want to debug this or not? And the same thing with the, uh, what was it, the database. If it doesn't connect to the database, it throws up a SQL exception error. So... Essentially, if you're passing information, especially through a stored procedure, let's say you're inserting data into a table, if there's some, some code there that's going to break, you can put a try-catch around it, and it'll break on that one instance, and then it'll catch, it'll catch the error, but it'll continue to do uh, what you need it to do. The other thing, too, you want to be careful, though, is you want to log your errors. If you're going to use a try-catch, you may not get data into your database, but you want to know why you didn't get that data into your database. You want to know why that loop, uh, that one uh, stored procedure of that loop failed. And so like when we did the um, <clears throat> refresh module there, I have it to where it will catch the error and it'll store that information somewhere to let me know, okay, these stored procedures need to be worked on because they no longer match the table definitions. So keep that in mind when you're using a try-catch. It's, it's great that it won't break. It'll go through all of the code. Um, it'll go through each time if you're on a loop or an insert or an update. However, you want to make sure you know what it did fail on because otherwise uh, you're going to have some error there that you're not aware of.